O.J. Simpson. The name alone evokes a torrent of emotions. To some, he was a football god, a charismatic athlete who um, electrified stadiums with his speed and agility. He was a, a Hollywood presence, charming audiences on the big screen and in Hertz commercials. O.J. was living the American dream. But beneath this gleaming facade, a darkness lurked. Whispers of violence, of a volatile temper, followed him from the playing field to the silver screen. Then, the unthinkable. The brutal murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman shocked the nation. The world watched, captivated as the trial unfolded. Every twist and turn splashed across the headlines. The evidence was gruesome. The accusations shocking. Could this American hero truly be capable of such a horrific act? The jury's verdict sent shockwaves through the country. O.J. Simpson declared not guilty, but for many, doubt lingered. The question of what truly happened that night remained. The official story, it seemed, was incomplete. Some whispered of a conspiracy of powerful forces at play, and in the shadows, a far more sinister narrative uh, began to take shape. A, a story that connected O.J. Simpson not just to a double homicide, but to a dark, underbelly of organized crime, drugs, and cold-blooded murder. This is the story that asks, what if O.J. Simpson's alleged ties to the mafia held the key to unlocking the truth behind that fateful night? Uh, for years, ru rumors circulated about O.J.'s alleged connections to the Mafia. They were whispers at first, easy to dismiss amidst the roar of the crowd and the flash of the cameras. But these whispers hinted at a hidden life, one that ran parallel to the glitz and glamour of fame. They spoke of shady associates, of backroom deals, of a world where loyalty was bought and sold with a handshake and a threat. Some sources shrouded in anonymity claimed that OJ was more than just a celebrity dabbling in the fast lane. They painted a picture of a man deeply enmeshed in the criminal underworld. They alleged that OJ used his fame as a shield, his charisma as a weapon to move drugs and money for some of the most dangerous men in America. This wasn't the world of Hollywood premieres and endorsement deals. This was the world of back alleys and unmarked bills where violence was a currency and silence was golden. If these rumors held any truth, O.J. Simpson wasn't just an athlete, an actor, a celebrity. He was a player in a deadly game. And in this game, the, you know, the stakes were higher than any touchdown, any movie role, any endorsement deal. In this game, the ultimate price was paid in blood. O.J. Simpson's journey from the housing projects of San Francisco to the national spotlight is a classic American tale. He was the kid who outran poverty, who rose above his circumstances to become a football legend. His infectious smile and undeniable charm made him a fan favorite, a symbol of hope and inspiration. But even as he basked in the adulation of millions, a darker side of OJ was taking shape. Las Vegas, with its glittering casinos and promise of easy money, became OJ's playground. Here, amidst the high rollers and the shady characters, OJ felt truly alive. It was a world where image was everything, and OJ, with his megawatt smile and effortless charm, fit right in. But this world of up, 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 bright lights and late nights came with a price. It was a world where the lines between right and wrong blurred, where, you know, temptation lurked around every corner. It was in this environment surrounded by the allure of wealth and the intoxicating power of celebrity that OJ is said to have first crossed paths with organized crime. The mafia with their deep pockets and their influence that stretched into every corner of the city saw in OJ an opportunity. He was, uh, 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 was a golden boy 
a symbol of success and his association with them could lend legitimacy to their uh, illicit operations. For OJ, it was a dangerous dance, a flirtation with the dark side that would have devastating consequences. He was drawn to the power, the excitement, the illusion of belonging to a world that existed beyond the rules. But this world with its seductive allure would ultimately prove to be his undoing. OJ's athletic prowess had, had brought him fame and fortune, but it was a uh, fleeting kind of wealth. The endorsements, the acting roles, they wouldn't last forever. The mafia, however, offered a different kind of opportunity, a chance to make money quickly, easily, and with seemingly little risk. All OJ had to do was lend his name, his face, his reputation to their operations. The world of drug trafficking with its promise of huge profits was particularly enticing. Cocaine in the 1980s was the drug of choice for the wealthy and powerful. And the mafia controlled its flow into Los Angeles. OJ, with his connections and his ability to move freely in elite circles, became a valuable asset. He was a courier, a middleman, a face that could inspire trust and deflect suspicion. He justified his actions by telling himself he was just a small part of a much bigger machine. He wasn't the one making the drugs, wasn't the one selling them on the streets. He, he was simply a facilitator, a cog in the wheel, but deep down OJ knew the truth. He was playing a dangerous game and the stakes were higher than he could have ever imagined. Section three, the price of loyalty, a tangled web of favors and threats. The deeper OJ delved into the criminal underworld, the more entangled he became. Favors were exchanged, debts were incurred, and the lines between business and friendship vanished. The men OJ had um, considered associates, men who had once treated him with um, a veneer of respect began to see him differently. He was no longer a partner, but a pawn in their game. Threats veiled at first became more direct. OJ was reminded in no uncertain terms of the consequences of betrayal. He had seen firsthand the brutality of these men, their willingness to use violence to protect their interests. He knew that if he tried to break free, if he talked to the wrong people, his life and the lives of those he, he cared about would be in danger. Fear became OJ's constant companion. He was trapped, caught in a web of his own making. The easy money, the, the, the glamour, the thrill of the game, it had all come at a terrible cost. OJ had traded his freedom for, for a life of secrets and lies, and the weight of his choices pressed down on him with suffocating force. Section four, the walls close in, Nicole's discovery and the beginning of the end. The cracks in OJ's carefully constructed facade began to show his temper. Always quick to flare became more volatile. His behavior became erratic, unpredictable. Nicole, once, si uh, once blinded by OJ's charm and charisma, began to see the truth. She saw the fear in his eyes, the desperation in his actions. She saw the man he had become and it terrified her. Then came the discovery that would seal their fate. Nicole, you know, while going through um, OJ's belongings, stumbled upon evidence of his double life, a bag of white powder, a ledger um, filled with names and numbers, a gun, a con hidden in the back of a drawer. It was a glimpse into a world she never knew existed, a world that both repulsed and terrified her. Nicole confronted OJ, demanding answers, threatening to expose him. She had become, in that moment, his greatest liability. The mafia, she knew, would never allow her to go to the police. She had seen too much, knew too much, and in the world OJ had brought her into, silence wasn't just golden, it was a matter of life and death.
section one, a desperate gamble, Nicole's reckless move. Trapped in a marriage, poisoned by fear and suspicion, Nicole saw no way out. OJ's world, a dangerous cocktail of celebrity and crime, had become her prison. The discovery of the cocaine, the money, the gun, uh, it was a wake-up call. She realized the man she had loved, the father of her children, was living a double life. And she and her children were caught in the crosshairs, desperate to break free from OJ's grip and secure um, future for herself and her children. Nicole made a reckless decision. She took the cocaine, two kilograms of pure uncut powder worth millions on the streets. It was a desperate gamble, a move born out of fear and desperation. She believed that with the money from the drug sale, she could finally escape OJ's control, disappear, and start a new life far away from the shadows that haunted her. She underestimated the reach of the organization OJ was involved with, the mafia, and by extension, the Colombian cartel whose drugs they were moving were not the kind of people who simply let a theft slide. They operated on a different set of rules, a brutal code of honor and retribution. Nicole's act of defiance was a spark in a powder keg, an act of defiance that would have dire consequences, igniting a chain reaction that would leave a trail of blood and forever shatter the illusion of the perfect life OJ had so carefully crafted. Some believe that Nicole's motive for taking the cocaine was driven by um, something more than just a desire for financial security. They argue that it was an act of rebellion, a way to strike back at OJ, and the dangerous world he had dragged her into. By stealing from his associates, um, she, she wasn't just taking their drugs, she was taking away their power, their control. Others. Um, speculate that Nicole never intended to sell the cocaine at all. They believe she took it to expose OJ, to pour, uh, force he knows him to uh, confront, they now, um, confront the consequences of his actions. Perhaps she planned to go to the police to use the, the drugs as leverage to ensure her safety and that of her children. Whatever her reasons, Nicole's actions were a desperate gamble, a roll of the dice that put her directly in the path of a ruthless and unforgiving enemy. She had become a liability, a, a loose end that needed to be dealt with swiftly and decisively. The Colombian cartel, known for their brutality and their strict code of conduct, would not let this transgression stand. The word went out, find the drugs and make an example of whoever dared to cross them. News of the stolen cocaine spread through the underworld like wildfire. The cartel's response was swift and brutal. They dispatched their enforcers, men who dealt in fear and violence to Los Angeles with a clear directive, recover the drugs and send a message that would resonate throughout the criminal underworld. The message was clear. Nobody, not even a celebrity with OJ's stature, could steal from them and get away with it. The whispers started in the darkest corners of the city, in the dimly lit back rooms where deals were made and scores were, were settled. They spoke of a Colombian necktie, a gruesome method of execution designed to send a chilling message. The fear that had been a constant presence in, in Sen, uh, the Omok Sundar, Shady Sign, Sazje, and now, um, and then Nicole, this is, uh, Nicole's lives intensified, becoming a tangible thing. They knew they were being watched, hunted. The life they had known, the world of luxury and privilege was kind of falling, was crumbling around them. They were trapped in a nightmare of their own making with no escape in sight. What had started as a fairy tale romance, a whirlwind courtship between a charismatic athlete and a beautiful young woman, had descended into a terrifying ordeal. 
The love that had once bound OJ and Nicole together had become twisted, warped by fear, suspicion, and the corrosive influence of OJ's secret life. Nicole, once drawn to OJ's charm and charisma, now saw him for what he truly was, a man living a lie, a man whose ambition and dangerous associations had brought violence and terror to her doorstep. She realized that the man she had vowed to love and cherish was now the very person she feared most in the world. O.J., trapped in a web of his own making, was desperate to protect Nicole and his children bound, but his every move um, seemed to push them further into danger. He had made a deal with the devil, and now the devil had come to collect his due. Their love story, uh, once the stuff of magazine covers had become a cautionary tale, a tragic reminder of the devastating consequences of ambition, betrayal, and the allure of the criminal underworld. The tranquil facade of Brentwood, California, a haven of wealth and privilege, was shattered on the night of June 12, 1994. The silence of the warm summer night was broken by the piercing wail of sirens, their red and blue lights reflecting off the manicured lawns and gated mansions. At 875 South Bundy Drive, a scene of unimaginable horror awaited. Nicole Brown Simpson, her once vibrant beauty extinguished, lay lifeless in a pool of blood on the walkway of her condominium. Her body, bearing multiple stab wounds, was a testament to the sheer brutality of the attack. Beside her, the body of Ronald Goldman, a young restaurant waiter who had stumbled upon the scene, painted a grim picture of a desperate struggle against a relentless assailant. The news of the murder spread like wildfire, sending shockwaves through the community and beyond. The idyllic bubble of Brentwood had been burst. The illusion of safety and security ripped away, revealing the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of paradise. The world watched in horror as the details of the crime unfolded, each revelation more gruesome than the last. As investigators swarmed the scene, piecing together the fragments of a shattered night, a chilling question hung in the air. What kind of monster could commit such a heinous act? The savagery of the murders, the sheer brutality inflicted upon uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman pointed towards a chilling possibility. This was no crime of passion, no impulsive act of violence. This was a calculated execution, a message delivered with cold-blooded precision. And the whispers started circulating through the back channels of law enforcement and the shadowy corners of the underworld, whispers of a signature, a calling card as unmistakable as it was terrifying. It, the Columbia necktie, the term itself sent shivers down the spines of seasoned detectives conjuring up images of the cartel's brutal reign in the drug trade. A Columbia necktie was more than just a method of killing. It was a statement, a grotesque symbol of power and retribution. The victim's throat would be slashed, the tongue pulled through the gaping wound, left dangling like a macabre necktie. It was a message designed to instill fear, to silence anyone who dared to cross the cartel. The fact that the murders bore the hallmarks of this gruesome trademark pointed towards a chilling possibility had Nicole's desperate gamble her theft of the cartel's cocaine brought the wrath of the underworld down upon her and, tragically, Ronald Goldman. The more the whispers circulated, the more they took root in the minds of those investigating the murders. Could this be the missing piece of the puzzle, the horrifying link that connected O.J. Simpson's alleged ties to the mafia and the brutal slayings in Brentwood?
people the Colombian necktie while we do was in, you know, while while a horrifying spectacle. Dazao was never simply about gratuitous violence. It was a calculated message, carefully crafted to send a ripple of fear through the criminal underworld. The sheer brutality of the act served a purpose to instill terror in those who witnessed it to serve as a stark warning to anyone who dared to betray the cartel. The symbolism was as potent as it was disturbing. The slashed throat represented a silencing of the victim, a permanent end to their ability to speak out or betray the cartel. The tongue pulled through the wound was a grotesque mockery of communication, a twisted symbol of the victim's inability to ever tell their story. In the context of Nicole Brown Simpson's alleged theft of the cartel's cocaine, the message took on an even more sinister meaning. It was a direct warning to anyone who dared to steal from them, to challenge their authority. The message was clear. We are watching and there will be consequences for those who cross us. The brutality of the act was designed to send a message, a message that transcended language, a message that would resonate throughout the criminal underworld. Betrayal would not be tolerated and the price of disobedience was death delivered in its most gruesome and terrifying form. Section four, innocent pawn or guilty participant, OJ's role in the tragedy. As the investigation into the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman intensified, the spotlight inevitably fell on OJ Simpson. He was, after all, the man who had shared Nicole's life, um, you know, the father of her children. But as, it, as detectives delved into the tangled web of OJ's alleged mob ties, a chilling question arose. Was OJ a grieving ex-husband or was he a participant in the events that led to the brutal slayings? Some investigators believed that OJ was an unwitting pawn in a deadly game. A man whose past associations and Nicole's reckless actions had inadvertently made them targets. They argued that the cartel, seeking to send a message and recover their, uh, their stolen drugs, had acted without OJ's knowledge or consent. Others, however, weren't so sure. They pointed to OJ's history of volatile behavior, his documented anger towards Nicole, and his alleged connections to the criminal underworld. Could OJ, they wondered, have known more than he was letting on? Could he have been complicit in the murders, either directly or indirectly? The question of OJ's role in the tragedy became central to the investigation, a question that would divide public opinion and fuel a media frenzy unlike any other. Was O.J. Simpson a victim of circumstance, a man caught in the crosshairs of a ruthless criminal enterprise, or was he a willing participant in a conspiracy that ended in bloodshed? Section 1, a city on trial, the LAPD under scrutiny. The brutal murders in Brentwood cast a long shadow over Los Angeles, exposing a city grappling with racial tensions and a deep mistrust of its police force. The LAPD, already under fire for its handling of the Rodney um, King beating and the subsequent riots found itself once again at the center of a storm. Every move they made, every piece of evidence they collected was scrutinized under a microscope. Their actions dissected by legal experts, the media, and a, a, a public hungry for answers. The specter of O.J. Simpson's alleged mafia ties added another layer of complexity to an already volatile situation. Rumors swirled that corrupt officers beholden to, 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 to powerful figures in the crimi, um, 
criminal underworld might be working behind the scenes to influence the investigation. Were they protecting OJ, um, shielding him from the, from the full weight of the law, or were they planting evidence, manipulating the narrative to ensure a conviction that would appease the public outcry for justice? The investigation into the murders became a public spectacle, a high-stakes drama played out on the nightly news. Every misstep by the LAPD, every questionable decision fueled the flames of suspicion. The defense team, led by the formidable Johnny Cochran, skillfully exploited these missteps, planting seeds of doubt in the minds of the jury and the public. As the trial pro progressed, it became increasingly clear that it was about more than just the guilt or innocence of one man. It was a referendum on the LAPD, on the justice system, and on the deep-seated racial divisions that plagued American society. Section two, lost in the glare, did the mafia pull strings? The theory that O.J. Simpson's alleged mafia connections played a role in the murders while never explicitly proven in court lingered like a ghost in the machine of the trial. Whispers of witness intimidation, of evidence disappearing, of deals being struck behind closed doors added to the sense that something was amiss, that the full story was not being told. Could the mafia, with their reputation for ruthlessness and their ability to reach into the highest echelons of power, have influenced the investigation? Did they have officers on their payroll, men who could be trusted to make evidence disappear, to steer the investigation away from OJ and towards other suspects? The possibility, while unsettling, was not beyond the realm of possibility. The LAPD had a uh, you know, a long and troubled history with corruption, and the Mafia's influence in Los Angeles, while waning, was far from extinguished. The fact that certain key pieces of evidence, evidence that could have potentially linked OJ to the crime scene, were either mishandled or went missing entirely, only fueled speculation that something sinister was afoot. Did the Mafia, fearing that OJ's connection to them might be exposed, use their influence to protect him, to ensure that he wouldn't crack under pressure and reveal their secrets, or did they, as some whispered, orchestrate the murders themselves, a brutal message to anyone who dared to steal from them, a message that would resonate far beyond the walls of the courtroom. Section three, reasonable doubt. When the jury couldn't see the shadows, the prosecution, armed with what they believed to be a mountain of evidence, presented a compelling case against O.J. Simpson. The DNA evidence, the bloody glove, the history of domestic abuse, it all pointed to a man capable of committing a horrific act of violence. Yet despite their best efforts, a shadow of doubt lingered, a doubt skillfully cultivated by OJ's defense team. Johnny Cochran, a master of courtroom theatrics and, um, and legal maneuvering, turned the trial on its head, shifting the focus away from OJ's alleged guilt and onto the LAPD's troubled history with the African American community. He painted a picture of a police force rife with racism of officers willing to plant evidence and manipulate the system to secure a conviction. Cochran's strategy, while controversial, proved to be effective. He tapped into the deep well of mistrust and anger that uh, many African Americans harbored towards the LAPD, a mistrust rooted in years of profiling, harassment, and brutality. He turned the trial into a referendum on race and justice in America, forcing the jury to confront not just the evidence in front of them, but the systemic biases that permeated the criminal justice system. In the end, the jury, unable to reconcile the evidence with the defense's narrative of a police conspiracy, delivered a verdict that sent shockwaves through the nation. Not guilty, O.J. Simpson, the man who 
many believed was a cold-blooded killer was a free man, but the shadow of doubt, the whispers of mafia involvement, and the unsettling questions about what, you know, what really happened that night in Brentwood remained. Section one, the verdict and the backlash, America divided. The words echoed through the courtroom, sending shockwaves across the nation, not guilty, on October 3rd, 1995, after a trial that had captivated the world for over a year, O.J. Simpson walked free. The man who had once been a symbol of athletic prowess and American success, the man whose face had adorned countless Wheaties boxes and Hertz commercials was now a lightning rod for controversy. His name forever linked to one of the most sensational murder cases in history. The verdict divided America along racial lines. For many African Americans, OJ's acquittal was a victory against a system they saw as inherently biased, a system that had for too long targeted and marginalized people of color. The image of Johnny Cochran raising his fist in triumph, declaring that this is for everybody who's been beaten, everybody who's been wronged by the system, resonated deeply with those who had uh, experienced firsthand the injustices of racial profiling and police brutality. For many white Americans, however, the verdict was a travesty of justice, a sign that wealth and celebrity could could buy free could buy freedom even in gain either even in the face of overwhelming evidence the image of oj hugging his legal team a triumphant grin on his face while the families of nicole brown simpson and ronald goldman wept openly in the courtroom was seared into the Assam theorists, um, uh, the national consciousness, a stark reminder of the deep racial divisions that continued to plague American society. The O.J. Simpson trial was more than just a legal battle. It was a cultural earthquake exposing the, the fault lines of race, class, and privilege that ran through the heart of America. The verdict rather than providing closure, only deepened these divisions, leaving a legacy of bitterness, resentment, and unanswered questions. Section two, the specter of conspiracy fueling a true crime obsession, the O.J. Simpson trial with its cast of larger than life characters, its shocking twists and turns, and its ultimately unsatisfying conclusion became a watershed moment in the evolution of true crime as a cultural phenomenon. The trial, broadcast live on court TV, transfixed the nation, turning ordinary citizens into armchair detectives, dissecting every piece of evidence, analyzing every witness testimony, and formulating their own theories about what really happened that night in Brentwood. The fact that the trial ended without a definitive answer, with O.J. Simpson acquitted despite the mountain of evidence presented against him, only served to fuel the bikes uh, public's, uh, public's fascination. Conspiracy theories flourished, filling the void left by the lack of closure. Had the jury been swayed by Johnny Cochran's masterful manipulation of racial politics? Was there a second knife, a missing piece of the puzzle that could have definitively linked OJ to the murders? Had the LAPD, either through incompetence or malice, botched the investigation, allowing a guilty man to walk free, the whispers about OJ's alleged mafia ties, while never proven in court, became a staple of these conspiracy theories, adding a layer of intrigue and menace to an already captivating narrative. Had the mafia, fearing that OJ might crack under pressure and reveal their secrets, used their influence to ensure his uh, acquittal? Had they threatened witnesses, tampered with evidence, pulled strings behind the scenes to protect one of their own. The O.J. Simpson trial marked the beginning of a new era in true crime, an era where the lines between fact and fiction, between entertainment and justice, became increasingly blurred. The trial, with its unanswered questions and its lingering suspicions, became 
a template for countless documentaries, books, and podcasts, each attempting to unravel the mystery, to separate truth from speculation, and to finally answer the question that continued to haunt the national psyche. Did O.J. Section 3, Unanswered Questions, The Mafia's Shadow Lingers Over Two Decades, have passed since the O.J. Simpson trial captivated the world, yet the fascination with the case and the questions that still surround it remain as strong as ever. The theory that O.J.'s alleged Mafia connections played a role in the murders, while never proven in a court of law, continues to intrigue and disturb, a shadowy reminder of the criminal underworld that lurked beneath the surface of OJ's glamorous life. Did OJ, blinded by ambition and seduced by the allure of easy money, make a deal with the devil, a deal that ultimately cost Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman their lives? Did the mafia, fearing that OJ's arrest might expose their secrets, use their influence to manipulate the investigation, ensuring that one of their own wouldn't be brought to justice. We may never know the full truth of what happened that night in Brentwood. The evidence tainted by time and the see some uh, the mishandling uh, of a flawed investigation may never yield all its secrets. The key players in this tragic drama have moved on, their memories clouded by time, their motivations forever shrouded in mystery. But the questions linger. They linger in the minds of those who followed the trial, who debated the evidence, who struggled to reconcile the O.J. Simpson they thought they knew with the man accused of such a heinous crime. And they linger in the annals of true crime, a cautionary tale of ambition, betrayal, and the dark underbelly of the American dream. The O.J. Simpson trial, a tragedy that exposed the fault lines of race, class, and justice in America, continues to serve as a stark reminder that some questions, even after the verdicts are read and the cameras are turned off, may never be fully answered. The Mafia's shadow, like the ghosts of Brentwood, lingers, uh, chilling, you know, you know, in showing tests all a testament to the enduring in enduring power of secrets and the enduring allure of the unknown section one the weight of speculation the theory that oj simpson's alleged mafia ties were somehow intertwined with the brutal murders of nicole brown simpson and ronald goldman remains just that a theory despite years of speculation mountains of circumstantial evidence about all this how is and countless hours of analysis by armchair detectives and legal experts alike, no concrete proof has ever surfaced to definitively link OJ to organized crime or to prove that the murders were a mafia hit. The whispers persist, fueled by the unanswered questions, the mishandled evidence, and the public's insatiable appetite for a narrative that provides a sense of closure, a sense that justice, even if served outside the confines of a courtroom, was somehow served. The see, see um, the, the image of O.J. Simpson triumphant after his acquittal continues to grate against the public's sense of fairness, a constant reminder that the man many believe to be a cold-blooded killer walked free, but speculation, no matter how compelling, cannot replace facts. The legal system, for all its flaws, demands evidence, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And in the case of O.J. Simpson's alleged mafia connections, uh, that evidence of his evidence, if it ever existed, has remained elusive. The weight of speculation, however, is a heavy burden to bear. It colors our perceptions, influences our judgments, and shapes the narratives we construct to make sense of a world where justice is 
often elusive. In the case of O.J. Simpson, the speculation, the whispers, and the unanswered questions have become an inescapable part of his legacy, a dark cloud that hangs over his every move, um, a constant reminder of the night terror claimed Brentwood and the world watched in horror. Section 2, The Enduring Allure of Unsolved Mysteries. The human mind abhors a vacuum, especially when it comes to matters of life, death, and justice. We crave resolution, closure, a sense that the scales have been balanced, that order has been restored. Unsolved mysteries like the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman leave us grappling with uncertainty, with the unsettling feeling that the world is a far more chaotic and unpredictable place than we'd like to believe. Uh, the O.J. Simpson case is a Dow with its cast of larger-than-life characters, its shocking twists, twists and turns, and its ultimately um, unsatisfying conclusion tapped into this primal need for answers, igniting a cultural obsession that has endured for decades. The trial itself, broadcast live into living rooms across America, transformed the legal system into a form of entertainment, a real-life drama filled with suspense, betrayal, and the promise of a satisfying resolution. But the resolution, the neat and tidy ending we crave, never materialized. O.J. Simpson walked free, acquitted by a jury of his peers, but forever condemned in the court of public opinion. The questions lingered, fueled by uh, conspiracy theories, whispered accusations, and the nagging feeling that the full story had yet to be told. The enduring allure of the O.J. Simpson case lies not in the answers it provides, but in the questions it continues to raise. It is a case that forces us to confront the limitations of our justice system, the complexities of race and class in America, and the enduring power of doubt. It is a case that reminds us that sometimes um, the most compelling narratives are those that leave us with more questions than answers, stories that linger in our minds long after the final page has been turned.